Hi, I'm Craig Smith, and this is Eye on AI. This week, I speak to Peter Schrammel, one of the founders of Diff Blue, an automated unit test writing software company. Peter spoke about the automatic generation of code and how he sees such automation increasing the productivity of developers. Before we begin, let's take a moment to thank our sponsor, ClearML, an open source MLOps solution. You can give them a try at clearml, that's C-L-E-A-R dot M-L. Tell them I on AI sent you. Now here's Peter. I hope you find the conversation as interesting as I did. Peter introduce yourself, give some background on your education and your particular area of study, and then we'll talk about automated code generation and unit testing and all of those cool things. So I studied in Vienna at TU in Austria and computer science and started my career at Siemens working on RF ID systems, radio frequency identification. So I worked from the firmware up to system integrations. And the so one thing that I noticed back then is that gaining confidence in the correctness of complex systems is really difficult. So testing, you always miss something. So there must be better ways of doing that. So I started a PhD in systems verification at Inria in Grenoble, in France. And there I worked on formal methods for system design, rigorously specifying the behavior of the system and then constructing a implementation that is mathematically proven. This is mainly used for safety critical systems, think nuclear power plants or airplanes and stuff like that. Automated tools around it are also used in hardware development and increasingly also for operating systems. So to make sure that they are secure, don't crash and so on. And then when I came as a research assistant to, to Oxford in the United Kingdom, I worked on techniques for software verification. So programs written in C, so still low level code. And this is based on a formalized semantics of the programming language. And then we're able to check whether C program satisfies certain specified properties. And this is known as model checking. And at a lower level, these techniques are based on solving uh, logical constraints. This machine-based logical reasoning is one of the oldest areas of artificial intelligence. And these techniques can also be used for automatically generating test cases. For example, you can ask the system what are the inputs that you need to feed into the program so that a certain branch in the code gets executed. And then you get the inputs and you can construct a test that executes the program. And then you've applied this to automatic unit test generation, is that right? Exactly. So this was the idea when we founded DiffBlue with Professor Daniel Groening from Oxford to apply this and essentially bring expertise in program analysis to a larger audience of developers. And the key idea was to change the way software is developed by increasing the level of automation to free up developers from chores like writing unit tests that machines can supposedly do much better so that developers then can focus on more difficult and creative tasks in in software development. Yeah, and unit tests, most of the audience we're speaking to would understand unit tests, but can you explain what a unit test is and traditionally how it's created? So unit tests are tests that are written while the software is developed before or during the development or slightly afterwards, depending on the methodology they use. And they test a unit of code, which is generally defined as the smallest part that you can reasonably test. Think of a class in in Java or a couple of classes that interact with each other. And so you write this test that check the behavior of just this small part so that when you compose these parts then together, you can rely on that. And 
something called test-led development. Test-driven development, yeah. It seems from talking to people that very few people really do test-led development, and there's a lot of talk about it. And a lot of people don't even write the unit tests as they're writing the software. Is that fair to say? Yeah, companies are at different levels with respect to that and have different approaches to unit testing. So test-driven development, TDD, is one methodology where you essentially start writing the tests before you write any code. And essentially the tests, the unit tests become the specification for the bit of code that you are going to write. Of course, the problem is you, yeah, sometimes you need to implement a bit in order to understand what are the requirements, and then you can only write the test afterwards. So usually in practice, it becomes a bit of a more iterative approach instead of a purist approach of writing all the tests up front and then writing the implementation. And what about not writing tests at all or writing tests for larger blocks of code? Yeah, so when you start with a software project, when it's still small, it's easy to write just end-to-end tests. To essentially test the behavior end-to-end. And then as it grows bigger, you realize you have so many end-to-end tests that execute slowly that you can't reasonably develop at a fast pace anymore because the tests are just too slow to execute. And then you realize, ah, actually, I should have written unit tests. And this happens in many projects. This is what we also see with our customers, that there are large pieces of code that are just lacking these unit tests that would enable them to move at a faster development speed. Yeah. And when you say unit on a typical computer screen, how many lines of codes does that contain? A typical unit test is usually between 10 and 20 lines of code, depending on... The test itself or those unit... The test itself. The unit can... Depends. A few hundred lines, usually. Yeah. And then there's legacy code that was written before this unit testing protocol became normal way of doing things. Is there a lot of that legacy code out there that has no unit tests? There is a lot of such code out there that does not have a lot of unit testing. And if you write code, and I think we talked about COBOL when I was doing an article on the resilience of COBOL and the effort to get away from COBOL. If you write code and it works, why would it suddenly not work? Can bugs develop in software that's been written and tested end to end and works, and then suddenly something isn't working anymore? Or do problems develop when people start changing units within a large program? Yeah, so usually problems start when code needs to be maintained. So it, software is not static that you develop it once, deploy it, and then it runs forever. So usually you need to keep pace with the technology upgraded. There is some functionality that needs to be added or changed depending on the business needs. So software is hardly ever completely static. And so that you can make these changes with confidence, you need a certain level of testing. Otherwise, you are going to introduce bugs. Yeah. And if you introduce a bug like in this legacy code that has no unit tests, how do you find the bug? Yeah. Usually, in the worst case, the bug gets found by the customer when something doesn't work. And then, of course, it's this is really the worst case in terms of reputation, cost to fix it, etc. And in that case, this is something I've always wondered. If you find a bug, you report it. Does the developer then look at the log file and can see exactly where in the program, in the millions of lines of code that make up the program, the bug exists? Or how do they find the bug in the code Base. Yeah, this depends very much on how much logging and observability there is in the system. In a large distributed system with many services, you need to have really good logging and introspection into the system so that you understand what is going on, so that you can actually trace and hunt down the actual location of the bug and understand what is going on. Unit testing, if you unit test the entire code base as it's being developed, if you make a change, how does the unit test help identify a bug if you introduce a bug? So when you make a change, 
and you have a reasonable number of tests, then the assumption is that at least one of the tests is going to fail when you make a change. And then, of course, you, you need to check whether this failure is due to the change that you intended to make or whether it's something that you inadvertently broke while making the change. In the traditional way, do you have, is there a programmer and then a test programmer and they sit side by side and work that way? Or is it one programmer has got to write a test or write the unit and then write the test, run the test? Or is there a, some way to spread that across more than one person? So usually the developer who makes the change, the software implements a new feature, also writes the unit tests. So it's not that people work on tests and the other one on the implementation. And when you're developing software from scratch, the same thing. It's the same developer that's doing both the test and the coding of the program. Yes. So for unit tests, it's the developer who does both. So yeah, it seems that automating that would be tremendous. How does AI play into this? I know that you guys use enforcement learning, and I'm curious to hear how that works. I also want to talk to you about some of the new large language models that are now writing code, either auto-completing code or writing unit tests, and how that compares to what you're doing. So first, explain how you guys are using reinforcement learning to write tests. Yeah, so at DiffBlue, we have a product called DiffBlue Cover that writes unit tests fully autonomously. And so the tests that it produces, they reflect the current behavior of the code. So they're meant to be used as regression tests so that you, when you make a change later, you can see that something has changed, which might be a bug. So this is the intention of how this is used. At DiffBlue, we, we take a approach from the programming language perspective. So since our background is in, in program analysis and software verification, we're not machine learning experts at origin. So we look at the problem from a programming language perspective. Almost all algorithms do something in this area. They essentially boil down to solving a search problem in a humongous search space. We've experimented with multiple algorithms that might be suitable. What we currently use is reinforcement learning, as you're saying, to perform the search. And I'm sorry, you're searching a library of unit tests, or what are you searching? So we are searching for a suite of tests. So essentially, it's a couple of tests that test a certain function or method in the code. And where do those tests reside? Are there libraries of them? or No, the test code is written by our tool. So we take the user's software and look at the various units, what we would consider units, like in Java, classes. And these classes have certain methods. And then we would look at the at all the methods, essentially, and write for each method we write uh, as many tests as are necessary to test the functionality of that method. So we essentially reverse engineering the specification from the implementation. This is what we're doing. And we are writing down the specification in the form of unit tests. In the case of Java, it's just a bunch of methods that exercise this particular method on the test. And this code is what we write. The search that happens in our algorithms is essentially in the space of all possible methods that test this code or might test this code. So we're essentially searching the space of all possible methods that could be written for methods that test particular parts of a method on the test. And then who actually writes the test? So the tests, our tool automatically writes the tests. So full Java code is, is produced by our tests. So you can compile it and run it to execute the tests. And why reinforcement learning? Is it because I don't typically, I don't think of reinforcement learning using being used in search. Is it actually writing tests and running them and then it comes up with the five best tests and the user picks which one they want to use or how does that work? So we usually compare it with the way AlphaGo works. So the automatic system for playing the game Go. And uh, that one also uses reinforcement learning. So it identifies areas of this huge search space where potentially where there are potential moves 
to win the game. And then they spend more time in these parts of the search space to actually make a selection of which move to make next. And then they repeat. And what we do is in some sense similar. We come up with potential tests, then we evaluate them to see what is the best test we currently have. And repeat this operation until we have a full test suite. And that's being done in the background. And the diff blue cover that customers are using then is being updated as you run more, as you train it more and more. Is that right? Not quite. We realized that there are additional constraints that we need to consider. For example, everything needs to run behind the customer's firewall for certain customers that we have. So it cannot connect to any service in that we host because the code is just not allowed to leave the premises. Another requirement that we have is determinism. So each time you ask the system to get a test for the same code, it must return the same test. Then we also had a requirement that the customer should install the system and get results within one or two minutes at most. And so if we also have a very small time budget. So for each method on the test that we are creating tests for, we are aiming at an average time of one second. So essentially, we need to do the learning on one method within one second. So we cannot do a large number of iterations. So we are limited in that sense as well. And all these additional requirements have shaped the solution that we have. But the learning takes place on diff blue servers. So in our reinforcement learning loop, we predict what potentially good tests are. And this prediction is based on a pre-trained model, if you wish. It's a very small model that we ship with the tool. And then we measure how good these tests are, pick the best test. Of course, in reinforcement learning, you have a reward function. And that is based on various criteria, like what is the coverage of the test, but also what is the aesthetics. So this is very important because the coding style, the idioms that are used, there are certain frameworks that require certain ways of testing, there is mocking. So there are all sorts of things that make this the, the reward function quite complicated. And it's not just increasing coverage. There are also other things that other metrics in the game here. And so to, so they chiefly we use uh, various techniques also from program analysis and aesthetics. So it's important that they test that they produce, they, that they look as if a human has written them. Because when one of these tests then fails, when a software developer makes a change, then they need to look at it and it needs to look familiar. If it was just some machine generated code, then it would be difficult for them to debug the problem and fix it. So they test, they need to pass the Turing test for tests, as we say. The human shouldn't be able to tell whether this test was written by a machine or a human. That's, that's interesting. How does this relate to what's going on in large language models and transformers? And I think you and I exchanged emails. There's a new paper out about something called T-Coder, T-I-C-O-D-E-R, purports to write unit tests using a large language model. Yeah, so there, there are a variety of technologies that one can use to solve such a complex problem, and no one fits all solution. And so some techniques are better for certain parts, our techniques are better for other parts of the problem. In particular with software, the functionality of software is in essence mathematically defined by the programming language semantics. So there is not really a need to reverse engineer everything from data. One knows what the behavior is. You can just use the semantics. Of course, for some cases, it's better to reverse engineer from data, but in other cases, it's better just to rely on the semantics to do to the logical reasoning. So we use a combination of multiple techniques. For the functionality, that one is mostly mathematical. There are other aspects like, I said, the coding style, the idiomatic aspects that are more preference-based, where more fuzzy algorithms are, are more well-suited. So initially, when we started with Diffplo, there were only few comparable tools, and they were hardly known by anyone. So now there are more tools, like you mentioned, these GPT-based tools, like GitHub's Copilot and also others. So the use case that they focus on is essentially the interactive use case. So it's essentially a very powerful code completion. And one reason why this is a good use case for this kind of techniques is the accuracy. They claim that they are 50% accurate on average. And so this is not a problem for auto completion because you can look for a, a couple of suggestions and you just pick the one that, that you want. So for the interactive use case, this is not a problem. And 
the accuracy will certainly increase as, as these tools get better and better. So at DiffBlue, we have focused on fully autonomous unit testing. So there is no interaction with the human. So it needs to produce reasonable results without asking the human what is good of it. Could DiffBlue cover draw on a large language model and then run the reinforcement learning on the unit test written by a large language model? It certainly could. We are we are looking at how we can leverage these language models to improve our tool. The I'm interested in where coding is going generally with automated code generation. Right now, unit tests is one thing. Alpha code writes complete programs, but they're very basic programs. In watching this space, do you think we'll reach a day where people can write programs in natural language and let the computer code it and write unit tests at the same time? It seems to me over time, these systems are going to be capable of of writing complete complex programs. Do you think that's possible? So when talking about the future of coding, I think we should not only look at coding in the narrow sense of programming something. I think look, we need to look at the software development as a whole. And the main challenge there is essentially how do I teach a computer to perform a certain task that provides value to me or customer? And so this is the difficulty. How, how do I instruct the computer to do that? And we go back in history, people were programming on the machine code level, and then there were higher and higher abstraction and on compilers that performed the automation to, to allow us to be more and more productive on higher levels. The problem is still there is how do I actually teach the intent to the computer? And so in, in the real world, software requirements are usually vague and so they are not, you're saying, written down in English language. It still remains vague to a certain degree. So to resolve all these ambiguities in English written specification, there needs to be some incremental refinement, some conversation between the human and the machine. And I'm, I'm convinced that the machine can help the human in asking questions about how they should behave in a certain situation. The machine might ask, but yeah, but what should happen in that case? Have you thought about that? And then that way, I think it is possible to develop a common understanding between the human and the machine, what the software should be doing, and then the machine can implement it. So I think the difficulty is interface between the human and the machine to to make this really work. So where we are at the moment is that we can automate certain menial activities and we can support humans in performing some of the more challenging activities. And then finally, we'll automate the latter. So it will certainly come in stages as a, a gradual development rather than a revolution. I'm trying to think of ambiguity in language in talking about program fairness, right? Fair is a very ambiguous word. But over time, it seems that a system would learn the various meanings of fair and could query the human developer about the various meanings and nuances of fair. Yes, certainly. So what you're saying is that it's gradual, it's iterative, incremental, but eventually we'll get there. Or do you think that natural language is never going to be precise enough for a computer to understand it and write code appropriately? Yes, I'm not even sure that it is meaningful or even desirable to have full automation. The purpose of AI or software more generally is to serve humans, as I said, to provide some value for a human. So there needs to be some, at least one iteration for the human to check that what the machine has understood is actually what the human intended. I had an interesting conversation with a guy who was at Intel. He's now got his own startup, but he was working on, I think he called it machine programming. His ambition or his vision was to eventually get to the point that his mother who was a businesswoman, could talk to a computer and have the computer write a program 
to do what she wanted, some simple task. And I know that Microsoft's Power Apps do something through a natural language, and it may not be the, at the level of a real program, but at least can create macros and that sort of thing from natural language. So on that journey from where we are today to complete program writing from natural language, how far along that journey do you think we are? Is it 10% of the way there or 20% of the way there or we we're not even at 1%? Well, this is it's hard to predict. It's certainly not next year or in two years. It's probably a few decades out. Can you put this in context, given the current shortage of software developers or coders, how automated unit testing can speed development? For example, what percentage of the average software developer's time is spent writing unit tests that could be done automatically? Yeah, so we have done a survey, I think two years ago, and so developers said that they spend roughly 35% of the time testing software. So there are some significant gains to be made just by automating a part of that. And in some sense, every business is a software business. So there is a extremely high demand in software developers. Um, that demand will only increase. So there is, it seems there is no limit to software that will need to be written. And with the salaries increasing and the car shortage, many companies just need to do more with the resources they've got. And it's also why these low-code and no-code frameworks are becoming more popular. People are able to implement certain software functionality without being a full-blown software developer. A prediction by Gartner, they expect that 65% of all app development will be done by no-code in 2024. I'm not sure what this number is based on. I would certainly expect that this will not displace current software developers from their job, but more software now can be written by people other than software developers that account for such an increase. And the 35% that you mentioned, if everyone used automated unit tests software that would in effect save 35 percent of their time and they could write a third more software exactly yes yeah it will not happen that software developers are fired because now an automation tool replaces them because there are always more software that needs to be written that's it for this episode I want to thank Peter for his time. If you want to learn more about unit test automation, visit diffblue.com and give them a try. They have a community edition that you can use for free. I also want to thank our sponsor, ClearML, which provides a suite of machine learning tools for AI developers. Check them out at clearml, that's C-L-E-A-R dot M-L. And as always, you can find a transcript of our conversation today on our website, ionai, that's E-Y-E hyphen O-N dot A-I. And finally, remember, the singularity may not be near, but AI is about to change your world. So pay attention.